Good morning. Happy Easter. How, how are you? Yeah, thanks. Who said that? Because last year was no one said it. Did you say it, Brad? No? Oh, okay. Well, good job. Thanks. Because there was this weird, awkward moment last time, but this time someone said Happy Easter back. Uh, if you guessed this, welcome. <clears throat> We're delighted that you're here to celebrate Easter with us. Uh, the bike deal, if I could just unpack that for a moment. Uh, we, we talk a lot about gathering and scattering around here, uh, being the kind of church that uh, the community is better because we exist. And one of the one of the things that happened in about the last uh, three weeks was there's a guy uh, who who comes to the 9 o'clock service. I don't know why I have to say it like that. That's why I pause. Like, why am I saying it's the 9 o'clock service? It doesn't really matter. It's still part of an area. Anyway, um, he's got, he knows somebody at Walmart who manages at Walmart or something, and so they had these 25 bikes that they were going to shove into the trash compactor, you know, stuff like missing reflectors and flat tires and uh, real minor stuff, brand new bikes. And they called him and said, hey, you want these bikes? And he's like, yeah, I'd love to have them part of this church, and we'll, we'll fix them up, you know, which is like put air in the tire and say it doesn't need a reflector. It's pretty complicated stuff. And, and then so we'll, we'll fix them, and then we will, you know, say to families around here, like, who do you know? Neighbors, coworkers, friends, who do you know that needs a bike? And, and we'll spend some time de- delivering those, distributing those. So there's also an opportunity, uh, kind of like the Christmas tree deal, uh, which doesn't mean anything to you if you're a guest. Sorry, I try not to use insider uh, language, but nonetheless, I already have, so too late. Uh, anyway, you know, you throw a bike in your car and deliver it to a family in, in the week that follows. So we're going to meet at 9, we're going to turn wrenches and kick tires and fire up the air compressor, and then I think we're going to barbecue when we're done, so there's that. And then also we need names. And most of the bikes are in the like upper elementary, junior high department. Like Most of them are full-size, many of them are dual suspension bikes. So not lots of little guy bikes, a few, four or five maybe. The majority of, someone needs to go tell those guys they need to be quiet. Where's Sarah? Okay, is someone on that? Seriously. Connor, will you go out there and tell them to tell them to be quiet? Just go out there and find somebody and say, hey, would you? okay, thanks, Bob. <clears throat> Sorry, it's part of the beauties of meeting in the theater. Uh, I think I was talking about, like, creation in six days or something. Don't know. Anyway, wow. Bikes. bikes. What, do you, what do you want to say about bikes? Even Just kidding. <laughs> okay. So if you're a guest with us, there you go. We're, we're going to start a, we're going to kick off a new conversation this morning uh, that we're simply calling uh, reducible complexity or church, what's the point? Simply is probably not the best segue. Uh, we're going to call it reducible complexity or church, what's the point? Here's really what we're going to try to do is over the next five weeks, we want to frame a dis- discussion really with this question. Uh, church, mm, who cares? Why should I? Uh, why does it matter? What's the point? What's the purpose? Um, we want to have a conversation about stuff that we feel like is quite common for people, no matter where they're at in their spiritual journey, to talk about. And yet oftentimes it's, it's not invited into the light to, to be talked about. Oftentimes it's stuff that happens uh, you know, behind closed doors and not in venues like this. And we feel like it's a valid conversation, an essential conversation. And so uh, we want to kick it off this, this morning. Uh, we, we feel like it's relevant because, uh, frankly, we feel like everybody, most of us, most of you, have went down this path no matter where you're at on your journey. Some of you, uh, you were raised in the church. You you might have even went to Catholic school, you know, and you did that whole gig, and you had your knuckles beat with the ruler. You were of that era, and you did First Communion, and you did catechism, and you were confirmed. Uh, Some of you, you know, you... You weren't. You were Protestant, you know, and so you went to Sunday school and you went to Awana and you know all, all the same conversation. But you were born and raised in the church. If it was open, you were there. And if you weren't there, uh, then your butt was in a sling, you know, like it wasn't going to go well with you. Like if it was, if it was open, you were there. And somewhere around adolescence, maybe when you got to college, uh, you began to, to ask the unaskable question: mm, What's the point? Why, why should I? Church? Who, who cares? And, and maybe in your case, it wasn't even necessarily that you were asking that about Jesus and his relevance and, and following him, but you began to go like, how, how, does, how does A equal B, you know? And, and, and began to really ponder that. Uh, others of you, maybe, maybe the whole conversation did lead you to drop both Jesus and the church. Uh, we we want to we kind of bring that conversation to the table. For others of you, there was a time in your life where you were lit up about a local church. You were probably heavily involved. Uh, if it was open, you were probably there. You were probably leading. Uh, it, it, was, it was central to your life and to your social routines. It was central to your recreation. And then some stuff happened maybe relationally. Uh, probably both sides a little bit at fault, but they had the microphone and you didn't. Uh, and, and, and frankly, for you, it, it became 
paramount that you slip out the back door or else you're going to lose your soul too. I mean, you, you feel like you were dealing with this, oh man, I don't want to lose Jesus in the process, and so I got to go. And, and maybe, maybe even today, uh, you're sitting here reluctantly because you're still not quite convinced that, that our, um, our way of doing church, if you will, coincides with what you read in the text. For some of you, uh, you, you've been following Jesus for a while, lit up about him, love him, serve him, uh, and you've never been involved in a local church, never really saw the point, always kind of read the text and went like, yep, I see something here called church, don't see it anywhere in, in my community. Don't, don't really see the two lining up. And so for you, you follow Jesus for some time, and it's just never been a part of your routines or your life. Some of you, uh, you don't follow Jesus uh, expressly because of the church. I mean, it's, it's precisely why you don't follow Jesus but because it so disenchanted you with Jesus that you've never really even considered who he is or what he's about or what his dreams for the world really are because uh, you just had this bad taste in your mouth. So those are the type of things that we're going to talk about. It's a conversation that, um, if I could be so bold, is real personal to me because my story is that I was raised Catholic and um, went through First Communion and all those different things. At about 17, I started hanging out at another church. When I was 19, I started following Jesus uh, seriously, so to speak, by 26, I was a part of a great church, uh, a part of a great youth ministry, a part of a 20-something ministry. And my wife and I, we started asking these very questions. But why, why are we doing this? And one of the things that started to occur to us that was kind of scary was the, the question of, wait, 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 could we be the church better if we weren't a part of the church? And that, that wasn't any kind of criticism necessarily to where we were. It's a great place. Uh, it had more to do with the fact that we just felt like the stuff that we were beginning to imagine, the priorities we were beginning to see in Jesus, the dreams that we were beginning to see God has, we started to go like, wow, what if we could do this better without that? What if the 10 or 20 friends who were living life with, what if we just, you know, loved neighbors and served neighbors and served one another's coworkers and that type of stuff real organically together? The other thing that was going on for me personally was there's two groups of people in my life at the time. Uh, one group, I had some were friends, some were influencers, some were authors, you know, and just people who I really respected. And the conversation always centered on uh, what I would call church deconstruction or maybe church criticism, uh, maybe even church hatred. And when I was in with these friends and reading these books and trafficking in these conversations, I was really at home. I think central to who I am is a visionary and a deconstructionist. And so I loved these conversations, loved to pick apart the church, loved to talk about what it was supposed to be and what it's not and all those different things. And yet simultaneously, I was a part of a church Worked for a church, got a paycheck from the church. And so there's a tension, you know, because when I was in this conversation, I loved the church and was leading the church and all these different things. And so uh, one spring, I just simply said to God, okay, Lord, uh, my, my integrity's bugging me. And, and I'm going to embark on a study to the best of my ability. I'm going to open the text and have conversations and crack open books. And Lord, I just need to figure out what's your point with the church? And Ultimately, God, I mean, my commitment to God was, I'm going to pay my fee and make my choice on the back end of that study. I'm either going to be in or I'm going to be out. So what we want to do is have this conversation and make it a safe place for the conversation. No fingers in anybody's chest, no shame, just an honest uh, question. And frankly, putting a lot of pressure on me and us and God to go like, really, this, Lord, this is a part of your eternal plan, like there's purpose to all this. Now, some of you, uh, I'm only making your point because it's Easter and it's supposed to be about resurrection and Jesus and I've talked for like five minutes and I haven't said either once, you know, and you're going like, hello, it's Easter, like we're supposed to talk about Easter and really I'm only just affirming your point that church is really about itself because all we're talking about is church and it's supposed to be talking about, you know, like empty tombs and we should have a fiberglass rock up here and, you know, I'm, I tried to get Lenny to wear a white shawl and he refused. For some of you, I'm really proving your point to which I say, hold, hold on, hold on. Uh... What if the resurrection isn't just an ornament on the tree of Christianity, but what if the early church, everything they did was derived from the resurrection? And what if that purpose and that meaning was actually bigger than personal salvation? What if to the first followers of Jesus, resurrection was about way more than the assurance that Jesus is in fact God, which Paul tells us it was, so that's part and partial to it. But what if it's about more than assuring us that some future day when you die, there's life after death? Because you can look at the resurrection and go, well, Jesus raised from the dead, so I don't know how it's going to happen, what it's going to look like, and I don't know any of that stuff, but it's just about the hope that I too will raise from the dead. 
What if the relevance of the resurrection is actually much more grand than some future date? You know, it's all going to burn anyway, so there's some future date, I might as well be in heaven, that's all that really matters. I mean, what, what, if, what if the resurrection in its relevance is actually at the very foundation of why church? And thus, the reason why we're starting the conversation this morning is because we feel like, uh, well, the resurrection, it drives all of it. So to have the conversation, we need to start with a question. It's going to be an odd question. It's not going to make any sense, but I'll unpack it a little bit. Uh, what if the resurrection takes us back to the eighth day? Like, what if the resurrection kind of rewinds the clock and takes you and I, should we want to go there, back to the eighth day? Um, c- come with me here. Day one, right? God creates. He continues to create on day two and three and four and five and six. We're told on the seventh day, God ceased to create. What happened on the eighth day? What transpired on the eighth day? And what if the resurrection is actually about the eighth day? Uh, think of Genesis 128. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like ourselves. They will reign, there's our word, they will reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, the livestock and all the wild animals on the earth and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Uh, when did people begin to reign? See, in the creation account, what we see is a picture of a partnership, a partnership between God and people, that they, that they would together create and add value to creation. When did that partnership begin? Genesis uh, 1, 28. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, when did that start to happen? Well, the parents are going when they were 30 years old and married. Right? That's when that started to happen. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and the animals that scurry along the ground. When uh, did, did this process of God and people contributing to creation, when did that happen? 2.15, uh, the Lord God, he placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. Right brain people love this because it's a picture. It's a picture of a gardener. It's a picture of an artist. It's a picture of a God who creates people and says, okay, I've got it this far. I've taken it this far. Now on day eight, move it forward. See, the picture from Genesis I would submit to you is is this. That God, for six days, creates. He creates some basic elements, doesn't he? I mean, he creates continents, and he creates oceans, and he creates minerals. He creates seed-bearing plants and seed-bearing people. He creates any number of raw elements. And on the eighth day, by the eighth day, God has kind of handed them over. It's not that he leaves. It's not that he exits the scene. It's that he kind of leans backwards a little bit and says to people, now, you make something of this. Sink your hands into the soil and move creation forward. It's not that God doesn't want there to be written language. It's that he invites people to create it. It's not that God doesn't want there uh, to be soccer. It's that he invites people to create it, to form it, to make it. It's not that God doesn't want there to be the combustion engine, right? It's that God says, here, here, do something with this. Now, to be sure, uh, God's got some ideas about what that looks like. And we know that because in Genesis 128, it says they will be image bearers. That image bearer term is packed. It, It means to be an extension of God's interests, You know, if you're a manager, it's your assistant manager. If you're an owner, it's your employees. The idea is create, but create things that reflect me. Make things, form the creation in a way that it reflects my value system, my ethic, my way of being. Genesis 2, God says, hey, uh, Adam, I want you to name the animals. God could have named the animals. Maybe God should have named the animals because we'd all got better grades in junior high science, Right? But he invites people to name the animals. Why? Because God is inviting people into partnership. We know that he wants it to go forward because the Bible doesn't end in a garden. It ends in a city. Gen- or Revelation 21 and 22. It's a city. How do you get from a garden to a city? You sink your hands into the soil and you make something of it. You move it forward. We, uh, God, God could have created more people, but he didn't. He invited people to create more people, something that most of us are quite thankful for, right? Move it forward, he says. Day eight. Day eight is about being invited into the garden with God and him saying, 
here, join me. Make something of this with me. Move it forward in a way that reflects who I am. Join me. Take the elements and move it forward. But the partnership didn't last very long, did it? Uh, we've, we've called this the fall for some time. And if we could summarize the fall, I would suggest you could summarize it as the two core problems, uh, selfishness and a distrust for God. God invites people to kind of throw one another's arms over each other and look forward and make something of the world. God invites people to join him in moving creation forward. And people instead say, nah, I think I'll do it without you. It's a distrust for God. It's a desire for life to be about themselves, not God. And that leads to this in Genesis 3. So the Lord banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. partnership didn't last long. But it is important to note that it's not that people stopped creating. The text tells us explicitly in Genesis 3, it's not that people stopped making things. It's not that they stopped sinking their hands into the soil. It's that what they started to make was brokenness. What they started to make was injustice. What they started to make, they started to duplicate sin, not God and his intentions and his character. People, they made sexual exploitation they made slavery. They made any number of injustices. They continue to create, but they create brokenness. Illogical brokenness. But in the midst of the story, God re-enters into the creation. He doesn't leave it alone. He doesn't leave it to just spiral out of control. He enters in through a guy named Abram. And he says to Abram, I'm going to bless you. And you're going to bless others. And what's born is the Jewish nation. The Jewish nation, uh, you, we'll talk more about this next week, but they oscillate in their success at putting the divine on display. But what they do succeed at is giving birth to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Born of a virgin. Lives, teaches, lives perfectly and profoundly, is arrested, is crucified, and is buried, and placed in a tomb. And when he was placed in the tomb, it was game over. No one was anticipating a resurrection. They thought, they thought it was over. They thought they had their Messiah, and they missed it. And to the surprise of everyone, including his best friends, he rose from the dead on the third day, which brings us to today. What, what, the resurrection. What's the point? What did God really accomplish there? And is it more about more than an assurance of life after death? Is there more to it than that? Uh, enter the Apostle John. I'm going to start in, verse, or in chapter 19, verse 38. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he f feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Uh, I'm reading the wrong version again. I did this last service. Uh, taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with pieces in strips of linen. This is the, was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Huh, a garden. 
Interesting. The whole story kicks into gear in a garden. Uh, the invitation by God, sink your hands into the soil, make something of this, move it forward. In a garden, death enters in a garden. And now Jesus is buried and raised in a garden. Now scholars debate, is this coincidence? Or is John actually capturing some remarkably artistic things about the resurrection? Uh, it goes on. John 19, excuse me, 20. 20 verse 1, early on Sunday morning. Wait a minute, Sunday morning. Uh, what day of the week is Sunday for a Jewish thinking person? It's the first day, and if it's the first day, it's also the eighth day. So wait a minute, wait a minute. The whole thing started in a garden, and now Jesus is raised in a garden. The whole thing started, the co-creation, the move it forward, the progress, the add value started on the eighth day. Jesus is raised on the eighth day, and then check this out. In case you think I'm crazy, I'll add to the insanity accusation. Mary was standing beside the tomb crying as she wept. She stopped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. You're thinking, slow down. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. It's a bad day when you're raised from the dead and your friends still don't recognize you. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Jesus. There's this lady that he's lived life with for a few years at least. He's raised from the dead bodily, physically, and suddenly she doesn't recognize him or John is telling us something. He's telling us something about resurrection. He's telling us eighth day, garden, gardener. See, the early church uh, often interpreted all of this quite intentionally. You can have debate. There is debate. But Jesus, one thing we know, is that early in his ministry, throughout his ministry, he taught a message called the kingdom of God. He kept saying, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, it's near, it's upon us. Uh, in fact, well, first let me just note that one of the more prominent places it shows up is in his prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, in heaven as it is in heaven? N no, on earth as it is in heaven. If a God who is perfectly content to save souls and then suck them up to heaven when they die says, hey, I pray that, that earth would begin to take the form and the shape of God's will in heaven, would he even pray that prayer? No, Jesus, he's alluding to this future state, this day that he keeps alluding to throughout his ministry. Someday soon, guys, a new kingdom is going to crash in. In fact, you could get yourself in trouble in saying this, and I will, and I'll say it. Jesus' dominant message was not a message of individual salvation. It, he certainly taught individual salvation, no question about it, about the need for forgiveness and blood, certainly. Jesus' primary message was a message about the kingdom of God, a time coming when things on earth would begin to reflect the garden, reflect God's will. And in the Jewish mind, uh, part of what got Jesus killed was kingdom of God was a very developed idea in Jesus' day. The Jews talked a lot about the kingdom of God, and it was quite clear what that was. It was a day when the Romans would get kicked out of Israel, when the exiles would return to Israel, when the enemies would be defeated and God would set up his literal throne on earth and things would happen on earth again in keeping with God's desires. Jesus got himself in a lot of trouble for saying, hey, uh, that day's here. And people went, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's still all this injustice. There's still all this brokenness. And he's like, yeah, it kind of starts like a mustard seed. But it's here. It's here. The early church, they took the kingdom of God and they did this already not yet thing. They said the kingdom of God has come, but not in complete dramatic fashion. It will continue to come. It, it, it's, it's landed. The resurrection was about a new era. The resurrection was, hey, uh, welcome back to the garden. Welcome back to the eighth day. Welcome back to the partnership. You could summarize it this way by saying that in the garden, God invited people to have relationship with him and to make something of creation, to move it forward, and people declined. The resurrection was an invitation to jump back into the garden, back into the eighth day. Put your hands back in the soil and move things forward. John 20, 
that Sunday evening. Huh, Sunday. Huh, must be a coincidence. The disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. Uh, if he, uh, anyway, I won't take that rabbit trail. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in, the hands, in his hands and in his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Genesis 1, God says, I'm going to make them image bearers. They'll create, they'll rule, they'll do with the creation what I would do if I were them. God sends his son and says, make something of this. And Jesus says, hey, uh, as the Father sent me, so I send you. Uh, N.T. Wright says it this way. The early Christians, they believed not only that God had begun the long-awaited new creation, but that he enlisted them through the spirit of Jesus as helpers within that project. See, we've been told our whole lives that Jesus came to reconcile us to God and that he did. Most certainly he did. But was God's intention ever for you and he to just sit around a campfire and sing songs? Was, was relationship, does it ever totally capture why he made you? No, you're made to be co-creators. It's why when you do whatever it is you're good at, whatever you're made for, whatever it is that brings you joy, it's why you think to yourself, I could do this forever, which is about a close-up description of heaven as we could give. God didn't just make you to sit across the table from Jesus and smile. He made you to partner with him to make something of the world. Yeah, Jesus has reconciled us relationally, yes, and back to the eighth day. A new era began. Is the world getting worse and worse and worse and worse? Or in the midst of all the brokenness and all the tragedy and all the injustice and all the wrong and all the darkness and all the earthquakes and all the stuff that a movement began 2,000 years ago that's headed the other direction? These are the questions of Resurrection Sunday. Did God kick into gear day eight once again, does he invite his people to make something of the world? So why church? What's the point? Well, I think we've all got to wrestle through this stuff. For me personally, uh, what brought me out of that conversation or what I brought out of that conversation uh, was simply this. Uh, God calls me to be a constructionist. He calls me to be a builder. He calls me to put my hands in the soil and do something. And one friend had to say to me, Adam, actually he was my boss at the time, Adam, it doesn't take any energy to be a deconstructionist. It doesn't take any energy to be a cynic. You don't even have to get out of bed. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is point out that everything, everything that everyone else is doing is wrong. I mean, you, you, nothing's required to criticize the church. Jesus invites us back to the garden back to the place of the constructionist. We go, yeah, 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 it's broken. Yep, we're an imperfect church. Yep, there's all, yep, we're not going to change the world. Probably not even going to change our community. Uh, you know, none of this grandiose utopian stuff, but we're called to be constructionists. Why church? I would submit that it's really rooted in the same thing the resurrection is rooted in. And that is God's desire to put things back together, which leads to really one question. Can I do, uh, can I put it back together better with others? It's really the question of the resurrection. Can I put things back together more efficiently and effectively with the team? God, thanks for resurrection. And 
Thanks, God, for your pursuit of us individually and the culture in which we sit, the community in which we sit. Thanks, God, for the invitation uh, to jump back in today, back into the garden, uh, back into the place where we make things of this world as you would if you were us. God, I pray for people here this morning who uh, are contemplating starting a relationship with you in a way that they haven't before or in some time. And God, just claim Hebrews on them where, where you affirm us that you reward those who earnestly seek you. So God, would you bring relationships into their lives uh, that can help them in that process? God, as a church, uh, we don't want to exist if we can't matter. And we recognize that ha that happens organically in our workplaces and neighborhoods and homes and where we just find ourselves every day. And it happens in these random somewhat trivial opportunities like giving bikes to kids. Lord, quite frankly, uh, the church historically has not done well at embracing both sides of the tension. Souls and social justice. And God, we, we're just asking that you would help us to embrace that tension in a way that does justice to your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You don't have to be seated. I just have a couple comments. There's an info card in the cup, so, you know, that's a great way to communicate with us. We're praying every Tuesday now, so you're welcome to come pray with us. You're also welcome to give us prayer requests if we can pray with you on anything. And, and then if there's anything you'd like us to know or any relationships we could broker for you, uh, let us know on there. And we'd love to, we'll be in touch with you early this week. Love you guys. Have a great Easter.